I went on the internet this week. Oh God. And I found this. I have a question for Mormon. Why? And this is no hate. If you are a Mormon, this is genuinely questions that I've always never understood about Mormonism. And I would love for you to answer. I don't believe you. I am also a Christian. I know you guys call yourself Christian. You keep using the word. I don't know think it means what you think it means. So, if we both believe in Jesus. Thou hast well said. And we both believe in the word of God. I Disagreement. I feel like these questions are very pertainable. To be answered. The two main questions that I've always had that I've never really understood is number one. one. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, found this religion based on a vision or an encounter that he had with an angel, correct? How about new? No? Then this angel sent him up to a hill to find these plates, etc., 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 etc. That's not entirely accurate. My question to you. I already said that. Is that if you believe in the word of God and only the word of God. What? Because this is the truth. You don't need any other book, which is another question that I have. Today, I would like to address the other major doctrine, which, which characterizes our faith, but which causes concern to some. Namely, the bold assertion that God continues to speak his word and to reveal his truth, revelations which mandate an open canon of scripture. Well, duh. So in Galatians 1, it says, No other gospel. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. Why, why do evangelicals think we have another gospel? Today, we are going to talk about that phrase, another gospel. And our jumping off point is Galatians 1.8. And this verse comes up a lot for evangelicals when they're thinking about what our church teaches. If you have evangelicals in your life or if you've read stuff online, you have probably come across this claim. You're teaching another gospel. Um there is quite a bit of agreement between us and them and, and some disagreement. Um, so what is the gospel according to evangelicals? Um, they would probably all start um, with, well, the gospel literally means the good news. No one here is disputing that. Evangelicals and Latter-day Saints would be on the same page there. Um, we do differ in some areas. One of the things they say is, this is from a, a popular evangelical speaker who I won't name for you. Um, he says, the gospel is imputed righteousness. What do we receive because we are counted righteous in Christ? The answer is fellowship with Jesus. This will remove obstacles to the only lasting, all satisfying source of joy, Jesus Christ. But let's unpack it a little bit. And we have to start with that phrase, imputed righteousness. What is imputed righteousness? It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ credited to Christians, enabling them to be justified. This is a term that comes from Martin Luther and the Reformation. And at the time, it was a corrective to what some of the Catholic practices were. The idea is part of a bigger package of ideas that include believing that God is angry at all of his children and will absolutely torture them for eternity, lest during their lifetime they make a profession in, of Christ. So Luther's phrase here, imputed righteousness, solves one problem, but it opened up another one. And lately, meaning the last 120-ish years, it has turned from, you shouldn't be allowed to buy indulgences, into, Jesus did it all, so you don't have to do anything. Augustine is correct here. He uses the term infused righteousness. And you can hear Luther 
playing off of the Augustinian term with his imputed righteousness, but Augustine offers us the idea of infused righteousness, which for him means God bestows justifying righteousness on the sinner in such a way that that righteousness becomes part of the person and that they go on to live a life um, where trying to strive for holiness matters. Here it is expressed by one evangelical pastor. He says, your salvation is a free gift. You cannot do anything to earn it. You can't even ask for it because asking would be you doing part of the work. If God is going to save you, he's going to save you. It actually has nothing to do with you. It is God's work. You are the object of the work, but that is all you are. They would all affirm that the gospel is good news, that it comes through Christ alone, but they radically disagree on what comes next. I think you can see at this point that the versions of the gospel offered by Luther and Wesley, two men who still very much even influence evangelicals today, um, the versions of salvation that they offer are radically different. And yet these two versions of the gospel don't really trip evangelicals up. They don't worry about the two of them being a different gospel. They, they accept both of them. But they couldn't be more different. They, they are in fact opposites. The only thing they have in common is Jesus Christ paid for salvation. In one version of their gospel, the individual is not required to do anything at all. And if you try, you're actually insulting God by saying Jesus is not enough. And in the other version, Christ paves the way for you. But you must also grow in holiness as time goes on in order to reach perfection. It's it's weird, right? Those are two entirely different things. But evangelicals will sometimes easily say that we, Latter-day Saints, have a different gospel. And if you ask for specifics, you're likely to get maybe quotes from past leaders that are not part of our standard works, them claiming that we teach things that we don't actually teach, um, things taken wildly out of context. So why do evangelicals do this? Well, I mean, one of the reasons, frankly, is that anti-Mormon propaganda has been effective. But how do you, what do we do with this? Do you want to talk about the gospel as Latter-day Saints see it, which includes a belief in the saving power of Jesus Christ that agrees with both Augustine and Wesley, the, the idea that sanctification matters, that holiness matters, all of a sudden we're just being too different. So again, no hate. Not one bit. Genuinely curious. I don't believe you. As the Bible says that if anyone believes a doctrine contrary to this one, it even says if it's been taught to you by angels. Joseph. Joseph. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Joseph, thy sins are forgiven thee. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. The world lieth in sin. They've turned aside from the gospel and keep not my commandments. They draw near to me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. Then let them be accursed, which means it's false. If you're a Christian, if you're a Mormon Christian, and you believe the word of God, then your religion is against the word of God, correct? How about new? Second thing that I do not understand is Jack's complete lack of surprise. Is why do you guys need a different book? Why do you need the Book of Mormon when you have the Bible? This is the true word of God and you do not need anything else. Some Christians in large measure because of their genuine love for the Bible 
have declared that there can be no more authorized scripture beyond the Bible. In thus pronouncing the canon of Revelation closed, our friends in some other faiths shut the door on divine expression that we in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints hold dear. The Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the ongoing guidance received by God's anointed prophets and apostles. Now, imputing no ill will to those who take such a position, nevertheless, we respectfully but resolutely reject such an unscriptural characterization of true Christianity. I'll show you in scripture. It says it. In Deuteronomy 4, 2, it says, You shall not add to the word of God that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Truly, you have a dizzying intellect. The fact of the matter is that virtually every prophet of the Old and New Testament has added scripture to that received by his predecessors. If the Old Testament words of Moses were sufficient, as some could have mistakenly thought them to be, then why, for example, the subsequent prophecies of Isaiah? or Jeremiah, who follows him, to say nothing of Ezekiel and Daniel, of Joel and Amos and all the rest. If one revelation to one prophet in one moment of time is sufficient for all time, what justifies these many others? Well, what justifies them was made clear by Jehovah Himself when He said to Moses, My works are without end, and My words never cease. The second scripture, which is in Revelation 22, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. That's pretty intense. That this verse applies only to the book of Revelation, not the whole Bible. Let me offer this word of caution, though. One of the arguments that I hear many Mormons use, or many Christians use, against these extra-biblical works is Revelation 22.18. And uh, it, many times Christians will, you know, when a Mormon brings up the Book of Mormon, they say, well, you can't use that because Revelation 22.18 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Folks, in this area, I think the Mormons are right. Yeah. This, this quotation is talking about the book of Revelation. It's not talking about the Bible. Um, how do I know this? Well, because the Bible as we know it wasn't even put together at the time Revelation was, was written. So it obviously wasn't referring to that. It's talking about the book of Revelation. Really, the reason that I'm coming on here is I'm curious, and secondly, I'm concerned. Okay. I know a lot of Mormons that really do love Jesus. You're tearing me apart! And I think that is so beautiful. I would truly hate for you to get to your end of your life and realize that what you believed about Jesus is false. It was a good ride while it lasted. And that this religion that you followed might not truly be true. Anyways, this is no hate to Mormonism. Please don't be in my comments screaming at me or anything like that. I'm genuinely trying to ask a question because if you truly, truly love Jesus and you truly love God, you would follow his word and his commandments.